Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's Knack at Home program. My name is Dawn Lilly. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit located in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. At the end of tonight's program, we will take questions and we urge you to put them into the question box while the program is going on. Dr. Miriam Roskin Berger, who will introduce tonight's program, was a pioneer in dance therapy in the late 50s when she was dancing with uh, the Jean Erdman Dance Theater. Since that time, she has taught dance therapy all over the world. She has been a founder and past president of the American Dance Therapy Association. She has received numerous awards. She has taught dance therapy at NYU and since 1975 and was head of the dance and education program there for nine years. She currently also is director of the dance therapy program at the 92nd Street Y. And fortunately for us, she is also a member of the dance committee. Mimi. Thank you so much, Dawn. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes with all of you to share a few thoughts on the most important core rationale for the use of dance as therapy and to tell you something about the current state of our professional practice. The most important concept and phenomenon of dance as therapy is the unique possibility that dance and movement offer the opportunity to experience simultaneously the concrete and symbolic aspects of any given experience on a nonverbal level that can then be extrapolated to the verbal and cognitive realm. This core combination is a very powerful experience and occurs developmentally in learning, in dance as an art form, and in ritual, and in the structure of therapy as a moment of real exper experiential awareness and change. These moments may be analogous to the moments when everything comes together to form it in the vernacular. These are the moments when experience is carried forward, so to speak, to another level of learning, of growth and of transformation. This vital human experience that can be transformative is the simultaneous experience of the real and the symbolic an experience that perhaps dance can provide most deeply. In other words, the real experience of the body at any moment can be fused with the cognitive process of symbolization. There are other important processes in dance therapy, which we will go into later. But now I'll just summarize for you some aspects of the current state of the dance therapy profession. In the 20th century, we can credit the development of dance as a psychotherapeutic medium to three main sources. Surprisingly, the Second World War was the, one of these sources and in some respects was responsible for the creation and development of all the creative arts therapies, music, dance, art, drama, and poetry because the return of many war veterans who were victims of what was then called shell shock and now is known as post-traumatic stress disorder demanded group treatments 
and treatments other than individual psychoanalysis, which was too costly and actually ineffective. A second source was the realization by modern dance educators that the study of modern dance in the very new college dance departments in the 1930s was responsible for the positive development of their students beyond their technical, choreographic, or intellectual achievements. And the third main source of dance therapy was the growth of humanistic psychology in the 20th century, an approach which studies the whole person and the uniqueness of each individual and which supported the perspective of dance's therapy. So now I'll just briefly note also what we have accomplished in roughly the past 50 years in forming the treasure of dance into the profession of dance movement therapy. Uh, we created the dance, American Dance Therapy Association. Governmental job lines have been established in many states. Standards for registration and certification have been developed and approved. Dance therapists can now be licensed in several states in the, the USA. And we have a close alliance with the counseling profession. Dance therapists can become national certified counselors. Academic programs on the master's graduate level were established in the universities. And now there are programs for doctoral study as well. And alternate route training has been developed for those in other disciplines. From the original focus on work with severely disturbed psychiatric patients, our scope has now expanded to include special education, developmental disabilities, family therapy, eating disorders, substance abuse, geriatric populations, trauma, victims of war, violence prevention, aid in national disasters, human trafficking, business venues, physical disability, neuro rehabilitation, medical conditions, and community building. And I'm sure I have left out some newly emerging areas. The American Dance Therapy Association has forged critical alliances with our counterparts in the other creative arts therapies. And we have established the National Coalition of Creative Arts Therapies and have found that there is strength in our collective numbers. And there are other crucial alliances, such as the Society for the Arts and Healthcare, the Arts Section of the American Psychological Association, and the National Dance Education Organization. And the American Dance Therapy Association is now strongly involved in the cru crucial issues now of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Initially an American phenomenon, dance therapy is now a global force, including dance therapy practice in Europe and Scandinavia, in Eastern Europe and Russia, in Israel and Egypt, in Mexico and South America, in India, in Australia, New Zealand, in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and now extensively in China. International dance therapy associations have been created and standards for practice reflect the specific issues and needs of each region. American dance therapists have been part of this global expansion through their teaching in other countries and through the work in their home countries of international students who have received their training in the United States. But they have been extraordinary innovators in every part of the world who have developed dance therapy reflective of their cultural identity and whose concepts are now being shared with their American colleagues. Well, with that brief background, I'm now very happy to introduce Dr. Cecilia Fontanese, who will go more deeply into dance therapy concepts and experiences with you. Uh, she is a dancer, a dance therapist, a dance teacher and researcher. As a dance artist, she has been practicing improvisation, modern 
an aerial dance for over 20 years, both in Europe and the USA. She is a certified movement analyst and a faculty member at the Laban Bartenius Institute of Movement Studies. Cecilia has worked with a range of individuals, including those affected by Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease at the 92nd Street Y and the NYU Family Support Program for individuals with dementia. She currently serves as the Research and Practice Committee Chair of the American Dance Therapy Association. She holds a PhD in biology neuroscience from the City University of New York and applies her knowledge of neuroscience to the fields of somatic education and dance. So now first you will see a brief visual history of the development of dance therapy in relations to dance, and then you'll meet Cecilia. And I just realized that Isadora Duncan is very importantly mentioned in the upcoming video. And so I wanted to show you this um, 1910 drawing of Isadora Duncan done by Abraham Walkowitz, which some of you may, may know was an important 20th century artist who did many, many drawings of Isadora Duncan. So she is here with us now, even today. An expression of ourselves, woven into the fiber of every culture throughout the globe. We dance for ritual. Hello, everybody. An unexpected technical issue here. I'll try to share with you the video again. Bear in this with me. Mm -hmm. Let's see if the second time works. an expression of ourselves, woven into the fiber of every culture throughout the globe. We dance for ritual, to reflect our relationships, our culture, and ourselves. At the turn of the 20th century, modern dance pioneer Isadora Duncan broke away from the formal dance styles of the day and sought to discover the natural impulses of the body. Subsequent modern dancers, such as Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean, together created Dennis Sean, one of the first modern dance companies. They started a modern dance movement that would inspire others, such as Doris Humphrey, Jose Limon, Martha Graham, and many other artists who developed new forms of creative and communicative expression. Many dancers and dance educators were influenced by this deeply personal and expressive way of moving. Marion Chase danced with Dennis Sean and discovered the use of dance as a means of direct communication and interaction. She began offering clients in Washington, D.C.'s St. Elizabeth's Hospital a new and viable treatment method. World War II veterans experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder were finding hope. Mary Whitehouse, Lillian Espinac, Trudy Shoup, Blanche Evan, Alma Hawkins, and others used their training as modern dancers to find new ways of creative expression. Dance movement therapy continued to develop. 
all were deeply rooted in the principles of modern dance and the study of movement, and realized the potential for emotional growth through this new and innovative approach. Today, dance movement therapy is recognized as a primary component in the psychiatric treatment of clients in hospitals, schools, private practice, and many other settings. Dance therapy seeks to help a patient express the inner capacity for moving in an integrated way where the mind and the body are all one and coherent and whole. So thank you, Dr. Berger, for this tremendous introduction. I'm honored to be here with you today to talk about dance movement therapy. A quick practical note, during this presentation, you can type any question you have in the chat box, which we'll have time to answer at the end. We just watched an excerpt um, from the DVD, Moving Stories, Portraits of Dance Movement Therapy, produced by the New York State Chapter of the American Dance Therapy Association in 2008. At, this, at the beginning of this short clip, we see that movement is calling attention to our common heritage. This brief video reminds us of the foundation of dance movement therapy in modern dance in the United States, as well as of the contributions of those therapists who started developing this field in the 1940s. As we were watching the video, I wonder if anyone uh, recognized Dr. Berger in a couple of still pictures that are uh, part of this uh, section of the video. Let me share this with you. This is uh, Dr. Berger working with the people she was serving at Manhattan State Hospital in 1957. So the, today, uh, when I was talking to my um, a friend and uh, colleague, choreographer and dancer, Annika Panito, she wrote to me and said, uh, it seems like a great idea when talking about dance therapy to talk about dance, body, and movement. So I would like to start this conversation sparking some ideas through and within our bodies and movement. Now, of course, in a webinar, webinar format, um, you, I cannot see you, but you can see me. So this cannot resemble a real world uh, dance therapy intervention. However, um, we still have bodies and movement. So each of us can tap into themselves as a resource. Um, the scope of this particular experience will be uh, for each of us to relate, observe, listen, to the information, to the intelligence stored in our bodies and movement. What uh, Dr. Berger referred to as a synchronous experience of the concrete and the symbolic. So let's begin. Um, follow me as you wish through this. Um, let's begin from our hands a very sensitive and skillful place in our body. So if you wish, bring your hands closer together. And as the fingers come to meet in the center, interlace the finger and simply notice which is the thumb on, on top. Also record for yourself what this crossing feels like. Now open your fingers and interlace them the other way with the other thumb on top. And notice what this crossing feels like compared to the first one you tried. 
you can go back and forth, but it's likely that one of these crossings will feel more familiar than the other. It's likely that one of these crossings will feel unfamiliar compared to the other. So this is a simple action and sensation, which may inform us of something much deeper, something that sometimes we call usual patterns of behavior, a behavior we know best that um, better than the other, and another behavior that we do not access as readily. Now stay with your hands for a moment and allow one hand to shape around the other, embracing the other hand, holding it. Do you know which hand is holding and which hand is being held? Can you reverse that relationship without moving? The hand that was holding becomes held. The hand that was held is now holding. Could there be a moment in which these two hands are mutually holding each other? This simple questions may illustrate the layers of meaning in movement. Meaning in movement is not always clear right away, uh, but it is to be experienced. Now allow the hands to come apart. So separating the hands and coming together again and shaping and then apart. Could these hands come together with no pressure at all? Like gently touching the skin, resting on the surface, molding with lightness. And come apart as if the air was being uh, blown between them. You could uh, try to slightly blow over your hands so that they separate. And as a different experience, could they find each other back with an increased intensity? Like a firm handshake, hands sticking to each other as if there was glue and then stretching open, letting go, unlocking. So this simple movement you can try your range between a very, very light touch and a much more intense grasp. So a very, every, every movement, any movement is not one movement, but is many. So it depends, movement variates depending on the qualitative character of it. In this case, we are changing the amount of pressure we choose to engage. And there may be opposite extremes as much as a range in between. Now rest your hands on your thighs and off for your hands for a moment and close your eyes for a second. Uh, lift your right hand and close it in a fist. How do you know you lifted this hand and how do you know it is closed in a fist? Now open your eyes back if they were closed. Um, a simple experience that tells us that movement brings attention to sensory modality beyond vision. There is a lot we know without even looking. Movement awakens our, the attention to sensory modalities beyond vision, modalities that have been here crucially and fully from the beginning, even in front of the screen. This capacity to know where our body is in space and how much strength it, we are engaging in with is proprioception, the awareness of body and space. But also there's tactile sensation. We were using tactile sensation before, the sense of touch, all the information we receive through the contact of the skin. If you bring one hand on the chest, the other hand on top, noticing which hand you chose, on top and close to the chest. And then shift your attention to the underlying movement of the breath in expansion and contraction, in the rising and dropping of the chest, a cycle that started when we were born and will exist 
as long as we live. A cycle that underlies each action, thought, or interaction we may have. Dr. Berger calls it the physical analog of the self. A cycle that tells us we are alive, a movement that is life proclaiming. It may inform us of how we are doing. It reveals in receiving and releasing air, a common medium that we all share, air itself. So the concrete is the interoception, the awareness of our bodily internal states. And the symbolic is our common medium, the air we share, but our commonalities. Now shift your awareness from the limits of your body, of your skin, to the space surrounding you. So from the space inside to the space around you. Perhaps engaging with the room in which uh, we are connecting from, moving your eyes and head to take in the ceiling, the floor, the walls, the edges, the corners. So look around and take in some information from what you're seeing. And moving your eyes around, you can play with attention. So you can focus on one specific object or detail in the room, as much as taking in the whole space using a diffuse attention, a soft focus. So play with moving from object to object to then broaden your attention to the vastness of this room. And lastly, I, as I was already doing, as you pay attention to, the, to this room entirely as, as a unity, um, perhaps extend your arms sideways as if you could reach and try to touch the walls and take your time with that. So take your time extending. Then come back to the center and then repeat the same movement, but with a sense of urgency. To so try the difference between reaching to the edges of the walls, taking my time, and urgency, urgently doing the same reach. So we could have a similar approach to any object as well. So grasp, like connect to an object perhaps a pen uh, that sits in front of you and try the same approach. An approach that quietly taking your time gets the object or urgently gets there. So the size of the movement is a choice. We can be far reaching or close. The timing of the movement is a choice. We can take our time or we can act quickly. So, to wrap up this experiential, this practice that we are using to touch base with some of the principles of dance movement therapy, I will ask you to revisit the places we explored. The interlacing of the fingers, the holding of the hands, a brief closing of the eyes to just move the hands, the arms in space, knowing that you know much more than what you see. Then placing the hands on your chest, noticing the rising and falling of the breath. Becoming aware of the space around you with the head and eyes, and then exploring reaching, reaching far, reaching close, taking time, acting quickly, acting toward an object or broadening your attention. To do this, we, with us, will be um, so, uh, music work from the vocalist Chiara Itzi. This um, musical piece is called Tierra Nardis. Uh, she's performing here live at Birdland, accompanied by Kevin Hayes and Nerf Felden. And the lyrics are in Spanish, 
and they talk about a journey to find refuge. So starting from the fingers. to a closure. What we just experienced, space, time, pressure, dynamic flow of movement are all things that human beings have to navigate the world. These are elements that each of us has to gain insight about the world. So these elements are an added channel in therapy, an extra layer of information to work with and beyond verbal symbolism. Dance therapists aim toward exploring movement to expand the possibilities to adapt, to respond, to choose. Finding out meaning as well as creating meaning in movement. Enriching lives, moving more and deeper. I want to talk a bit more about dance therapy and bring you some real world examples that show you the movement relationship between a therapist and the people they are working with. I'm gonna share a very short presentation.
So dance movement therapy is founded on the underlying premise that the mind and body are inherently intertwined and that a person's psychological and physiological health cannot be separated. The therapeutic use of movement and dance is founded on the principle of motion and emotion being completely intertwined, interdependent. The American Dance Therapy Association defines dance movement therapy as the psychotherapeutic use of movement to promote emotional, social, cognitive, and physical integration of the individual. The word integration has a dual meaning of both complete and whole, as well as inclusive and accepting. The structure of a dance movement therapy session can vary depending on the therapy format, whether it's a group format or an individual session and patient characteristics, their age, diagnosis, physical abilities. Uh, dance movement therapy is practiced in, the, in mental health uh, clinic, rehabilitation clinic, hospitals, educational and forensic settings. Um, nursing home, daycare centers, and um, in private practice as well. People of all ages, races, ethnic backgrounds, individual couples, family, and group therapy um, have access to this um, type of therapy. I, as I want to bring you some real world examples, I need to acknowledge that these examples are very limited. I apologize in advance for not being able to represent through the examples I will bring tonight, the plurality of identities among both clients and practitioners. It is important to remember that movement behavior is affected by community, ethnicity, gender identity, um, socioeconomic status, ability, age, sexual identity. These are the examples I will show you tonight. As you see, there are three different examples, two of them coming from the DVD Moving Stories, portraits of dance movement therapy produced by the New York State chapter of the American Dance Therapy Association. And one of them produced by an independent director in France, Gerald Assouline, um, with in collaboration with the dance movement therapist, Job Cornelison. Uh, he is a Dutch, movement therapist and um, the other two videos are from the work of two American dance movement therapists. As I share these examples, I need to make another premise. It may be helpful to remember that different services exist ranging from art appreciation, art in healthcare, also called therapeutic dance and creative art therapies. This different approaches currently exist with different professional specifications, notably educational requirements, professional ethics and responsibilities. Fewer dance movement therapy interventions are available on video, while images of therapeutic dance are more easily disseminated through publicly accessible media. All the content you will see tonight portrays dance movement therapists working with patients who consented to the use of this material. Also, you will have a chance to appreciate perhaps regional differences in style. So dance with my therapy with children with the work of dance movement therapist, Susie Tortora. We're not really working on skill development as our primary tool. We're working on creating a safe environment that allows a child to reach their potential and show me who they are. Well, whenever I'm working with children, I always include the family. Sometimes they're actually active participants in the session, as you saw with the mom. Other times they're observers and get involved intermittently, as actually happens with the older boy. 
I had the mom watch what we were doing, and then I had her become part of it without doing things to the baby and for the baby. But instead, that they're both active, independent communicators that are creating the relationship together. And then I want to help support that through that ex exploration experience they have and these positive experiences they have on a body level, that that helps support their emotional self as well. Well, this child came to me with clear developmental issues. I felt for him that if I could get him to have a really physical body schema, that that could start to slow him down. And that's actually exactly what happened. My first task was to help him feel how his body expanded and contracted, rather than always being in contraction. And so I f was trying to attune, to match, and to shape myself through, very literally, the way I touched him, the way I moved with him, and the way I had mom move with him, to address that primary way of communicating. So I wanted him to experience what it was like to glide and to flow and to move and to allow his joints and his arms to create greater range of motion. And as that happened, he started to sense and feel different about himself. And movement as a way of then, you know, affecting every part of his development. It's helped him be more flexible in his language. It's helped him be more flexible in relationships. We, we just see growth in other areas after, after he's attained new ways of moving. And it just fortifies everything else we're doing for him. He's so much able to just be who he is, whether it's frustrated or silly or happy. The biggest difference for Thomas is that he's so much more a participant. He's now running, playing soccer. The expression through movement and dance has been a gateway for him. So in this short clip, you saw um, Dr. Susie Tortora talking about bodily organization, bodily schema, and um, working in relationship with her clients, with her patients, and with the family. So this is part of what we couldn't really experience tonight is the therapeutic movement relationship, which is one of the founding principles of this practice. The ability to talk, to ask and respond. Um, she's able to show the relational support of the dance therapy intervention as um, evidenced by what the mothers report. And it's also very important to notice that this video shows how the dance therapy intervention translates into development of language and relational abilities for these kids. And borrowing the word of the mother is really a gateway to growth and development. Now I want to show you a second clip uh, of DMT uh, with adults in a psychiatric setting. Uh, here we will see the work of dance therapist um, and professor um, Ted Earhart. All of our patients are here because they are judged to be either at risk for hurting themselves hurting someone else or being hurt because they themselves are so disorganized or so in such deep trouble. At the same time, they're presenting us with, I, I, want, I want a way out of the labyrinth. I feel most of my patients want recognition. They want me to, to know that they are there, to value them, to be with them. And I can't do it with words because they, they've heard all the words. I believe that the patients will invest in the movement as long as they are convinced that it is expressive of their needs. And what I want them to do is to go from movement to metaphor and then make a connection with the metaphor with their own internal selves. Apples, let's put it right here, this huge fruit. Come on, for Christmas. For Christmas, what's here for Christmas? A lot of presents. Presents, where are they, what are they? What are they here? Uh, I see a bike. 
A bike. What kind of bike? <laughs> Harley <laughs> Davidson. A Harley Davidson. <laughs> when a patient comes up with an image and everyone is willing to pick it up and develop it further, to me that satisfies the primary requirement of the group. It's satisfying some basic need that's not verbalized but is, is present. In tonight's group, we sometimes would break the circle and just move freely around the space. And at one point when we were moving freely around the space, I thought to myself, I'd like to see if we can form a line and move across the space as one unit. I find that for many people, that elicits a sense of unity and confidence and kind of uh, respect. Equally as important, I think, is the restoration for our patients of a sense of pleasure. There is something intrinsically pleasurable about dance in this context. For most of our patients, it works. Can I trust myself moving with you? Can I display my body in this way with you and not be judged but be joined? Is it safe? Do you accept me? I mean, this is a pretty intimate movement, if you think about it. It's an intimate exchange in a kind of conventional context, in a very, very unconventional world here. In my work, the most rewarding thing is a sense of having connected with these people, these clients whom I really value, whom I feel are noble and courageous. I want to be in their company. The things we value are a sharing and movement experience. The movement will surprise us, it will challenge us, it will entertain us, it will make things difficult, it will make things fun. It was, that is what I'm talking about, and that we can find a place in the community for. I have little to add to the words of Ted Earhart, um, but he is stressing the value of um, a principle also known as installation of hope at the very beginning when he says that um, these patients want a way out, out from the labyrinth. And you see over and over during this uh, example of his work, that the relationship in the group between, in, between participants and members of the group is um, verbal and nonverbal uh, because they heard all the words. That there is a sense of mutual support, of trust, of joining in, of safety in doing so, or, or courage in doing so. And also you probably were able to appreciate um, this symbolic use of group configuration, whether it's the circle where everybody places a gift in the center, or whether it is a line where people advance together. So again, to the um, initial opening statement of Dr. Berger, the concrete, a circle, a line, the symbolic. This is what we share. And he says, with the line, a sense of respect and trust. I have one more clip I want to show you. So the last clip for this evening is um, DMT, dance therapy with older adults uh, who have dementia, um, work by Job Cornelissen, uh, Dutch Association for Dance Movement Therapy.
quand on fait l'atelier, là, je trouve que vous avez une liberté d'imagination, en quelque oui, sorte. Oui, mais je crois qu'il y a quelque chose de ça. Vous vous laissez flotter. Vous voyez, j'ai été bonne en français. Hein, quand j'étais au lycée, j'étais très bonne en français parce que je me laissais aller, je racontais des trucs, des trucs, des trucs. Voilà, c'est ça. <rire> ça, j'avais pas de mal à inventer. Et je sais que moi, j'ai... Quand je, je fais rire mes, mes copines par là, quand elles me cassent et tout, je lui leur dis, mais raconte-toi une histoire que tu ne connais pas. Alors elle me regarde avec des yeux ronds. Je dis, mais oui, invente-toi une histoire et puis tu, tu... Et moi, c'est ce que je fais, je me raconte des histoires. J'aurais pu être écrivain, peut-être s'il m'avait voulu me les donner la peine. Et vous avez toujours été une silencieuse. Oui. Parce que je vous trouve très silencieuse comme dame. Chez nous, on dit tes œufs, un petit peu. Ben, C'est-à-dire que j'étais toute seule. Hein. Ah, ouais. Ni frère ni sœur, alors il fallait que je me. Ouais, c'est ça. Je n'avais pas de conversation chez vous. Je ne parlais pas. Hein. Vous étiez fille unique. Malheureusement. Eh oui, c'est dur, hein, fille unique. Parce qu'après, il a fallu, fallu s'occuper des parents et tout ça, quoi. Puis toute seule. On est seul dans la joie, comme dans la peine. Enfin, j'ai que j'ai soigné jusqu'à la fin. Mes parents, ma belle-mère, mon mari. I will pause here just to comment briefly um, about this particular clip, which shows some of the specific needs of those who live with dementia, uh, dealing with feelings of loneliness, abandonment, and neglect, powerlessness, uh, worthlessness. Um, how dance movement therapy, um, a dance movement therapist would approach um, one of these uh, people with curiosity to know the person with attentiveness, paying attention to the breath. Um, if you saw at the very end when, uh, when Job is asking the woman to contribute, her patient to contribute a movement, she is lengthening the spine and taking a breath. So exploring a range of movement, a range of affect, and uh, offering choices. And as you could with, and as you were able to witness, there was creative expression, emotional sensitivity, the ability to learn, social connectedness. If you, I hope you saw in the last uh, 
part of the clip, the person in the wheelchair who is making eye contact to everybody around her. And this um, idea of self-efficacy, the, the very first person we see, she is talking about, um, she's talking about her ability in French um, and her ability to make up stories. So to tap for her to tap into her own belief of being able of ability is um, self-efficacy. So I want to call uh, Laura and Miriam in the room for, to give space to some questions for our Q&A. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, and good evening, everybody. Again, my name is Laura Daly. I'm with Dawn. I'm co-chair of the dance committee. And we do have some questions. So um, our first question was, does your organization ever work with and help dancers who have PTSD and or other medical conditions? Well, I can answer that, yeah. Well, it's not that the organization works with them, but dance therapists do, do of course, work with other dancers. Interestingly enough, sometimes that's a very um, hard, hard relationship because it's sometimes difficult for dancers since it's so, so close to them, dance is so close to them. It's sometimes easy to use it as a therapeutic medium and it's sometimes very difficult. So it's hard to say which will be the case in any, in any situation. Mm -hmm. um, another question we just got, um, how would an individual um, find dance therapy near them if they needed it? Um, I, so I would go on the American Dance Therapy website. If you Google American Dance Therapy, um, ADTA website, there is um, a section in the website where you find a DMT, a dance therapist uh, around you. So you, there's a listing of all practitioners who are a member of the professional association and you can find, uh, you can search them um, on a geographical basis. Okay, great. Um, another question is, uh, what kind of tools do dance movement therapists have to assess movement? So in um, the, the video you watched where Susie Tortora was uh, working with children, she uses some words um, that come from um, a theoretical framework which is called Laban Movement Analysis that we employ in dance movement therapy. It is not, uh, the, it's a the theoretical framework, which is also a notation system, not the only notation system existing in the world for dance notation or movement notation. But um, this is the one more commonly, commonly employed. Uh, importantly, any system of uh, analysis or notation of movement allows us to talk about movement before we talk about meaning. So we use that for assessment and to plan interventions. Um, another question is, uh, what are your thoughts about alternative um, dance movement therapy certification programs? Well, um, since I uh, am involved with that sort of training now, um, I think it's a very important uh, aspect of dance therapy education now. Uh, there are master's programs for people to become registered and then certified dance therapists. And then we have alternate route training for people in other disciplines, psychologists, social workers, counselors, who have degrees in their own disciplines and then uh, <clears throat> become certified dance therapists in order to use movement as part of their, uh, as part of their therapeutic work. So I think it's a very important new aspect of dance therapy work of, of alternate route training for, uh, for other disciplines. Excellent. Um, is it necessary for a dance movement therapist to be a trained dancer? And as an adjunct to that question, um, how does one become a dance movement 
therapist? Well, um, I think that uh, the more dance experience you have, the better it is for you as you train to be a dance therapist. It's best to uh, have experience in all forms of dance. And also it's very important for someone to have a, a talent to improvise. Uh, there are musicians who are great musicians but can't improvise. And there are dancers who are great dancers who can improvise, but it's very important for a dance therapist to improvise. And um, the training of a dancer uh, is very reflective of what we do in psychotherapy because in dance, we study technique in order to dance on the stage with as much freedom as possible. And at the same time to have as much control as possible. And that's what we're doing in psychotherapy, dance therapy or any form of psychotherapy. We're trying to help people live their lives with as much freedom as possible and paradoxically at the same time with as much control. So the relationship between dance and psychotherapy is a very important one. Thank you. Um... Another question is how does um, dance movement therapy dovetail with more traditional forms of physical therapy? Where's, where is the intersection? So with traditional, like uh, phys physical therapy as PT, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So in, in Laban movement analysis, there's a, a dichotomy that explains this difference, which is function expression. And uh, one of the um, women who developed uh, the field of dance movement therapy, which uh, whom we didn't name at the beginning, Irmgard Bartenev, who was also collaborator of Laban, her own motto was motivate to activate. So there's a profound difference if we look at um, the function of the body as uh, relative to or important for functioning, or, uh, as opposed to um, the movement of the body integrated with telling a story, experiencing oneself more deeply and um, transforming the person in all aspects. Okay, excellent. Um, I think that about does it. Um, I want to thank Cecilia and Miriam and Dawn um, for a wonderful presentation. And thanks to the National Arts Club, Club for presenting it. Um, dear audience, thank you for attending. You were all very engaged, lots of questions, many, many comments. Um, so we, we love that. Um, so just as a reminder that this presentation, if you would like to watch it again or tell your friends about it, will be on um, the National Arts Club YouTube channel as are all the NAC uh, at home events. So thank you all, it was wonderful. And I hope everybody has a lovely evening. So good night, everyone. Good night.